Let's continue our conversation about weeds with an interesting topic. And it's about weeds telling us a story of the landscape. Now, this gets into an area that may or may not be very well researched. And so you have lots of speculation and nice sounding stories sometimes, but it's important to consider how weeds are functioning in the landscape and those times when we can use their presence or absence to indicate what else is happening in the landscape. Uh, very simply, if a weed is growing, it is using certain nutrients and it is out competing other plants. So if we learn something about the biology of that plant, the weed, we can understand why it is doing so well in that area. And sometimes you could use that information to help guide landscape management decisions. So I'll show you a few plants here. This is not my list. I'm borrowing it from another source, but I have curated this list to include the plants that I do know, that I recognize, that I've worked with, and it does ring true somewhat to my personal experience. And more than anything, I present it as food for thought or an encouragement to not jump toward a negative judgment too soon, but to respond uh, rationally to what's going on in our natural ecosystems and in our landscapes. So here we go with a little presentation of weeds as indicators of soil health. The first one we'll talk about is crabgrass. Crabgrass is a common uh, weed in turf, in lawns, parks. It grows in these thick clumps, forming a, a round rosette that will then die and leave a big gap in your lawn. And crabgrass, it is said, grows in soil that is overall low in nutrients, but specifically low in calcium. It outcompetes those plants in these environments. And so instead of fighting the crabgrass, you could try to fight the conditions that led to the crabgrass. Similarly, dandelion is a common landscape weed. Uh, many people like it. It's also an edible vegetable. Um, dandelion similarly indicates soil low in calcium, but high in potassium. And others have speculated that the deep taproot of dandelion uh, is an indicator of compacted soil. And so only dandelion can grow in the soil that's compacted. It outcompetes the other plants. So relieve compaction and perhaps adjust some nutrients, and you will have less dandelion weeds. Next up, we have purslane. This is a common weed in a vegetable garden. Uh, it's also an edible plant that you can eat raw or fresh. So people like it for that reason. But uh, it tends to grow in areas that have rich, fertile soil. So if you don't want the purslane, but you see it growing in that spot, that's an indicator that it's a great place to grow other things. And perhaps you will not have as much purslane if you have the plants that you choose. In particular, it is said that purslane grows in soil that is high in phosphorus. So thistle is a common landscape weed, often indicative of dry, heavy, acidic, and iron deficient soil. Stinging nettle, another common landscape weed, uh, can be an indicator of a good quality soil that is high in nutrients. This plant grows in soil that is rich in nitrogen and phosphorus and is well aerated. Oftentimes, uh, you'll receive an abundance of stinging nettle if you've over fertilized a landscape. If you broadcast fertilizer all over the place without any consideration of how much you're applying and what the plants actually need, the next year you'll probably get a ton of stinging nettle. It grows in areas of high nutrients. White clover is a legume. It's in the Fabaceae family. 
And plants in that family have a special symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria, and they can actually get nitrogen out of the sky, out of the atmosphere. Whereas most plants cannot do that, they need to receive their nitrogen from the soil. So if you have an abundance of white clover, it's the opposite of the stinging nettle, and it indicates that you have a deficit in nitrogen. So other plants won't grow because there's not enough nitrogen, but the white clover can. White clover is a common weed in lawns and turf grass. There was a time when clover and grass went together and they were even encouraged. And then once uh, turf grass managers switched over to using uh, artificial fertilizers for their turf, uh, having or encouraging the white clover kind of fell out of favor. However, clover and grass grow just fine together, and you may decide to not consider this a weed at all, depending on your circumstance. It's very different if you have a grassy area as a park versus uh, a well-manicured lawn on a putting green, for example. So depending on the application, you may choose to tolerate the white clover or even welcome the white clover for the job that it is doing and uh, avoid the pesticides altogether that will target white clover in favor of your grass. So there we go with just a few quick examples of landscape weeds and what they might be indicating about the conditions of your garden. And if you think creatively and you make careful observations, you can make wise choices based off of what the weeds are telling you about the soil health in your landscape.